First of all, I just made the world's best, worst mistake. I said hit. But I tell him hit, then I'm saying, oh God, why are you hitting the ball so hard? I said, you said hit it. Michelle Krause. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hi. The cardio tennis lady. Okay, um, grab an old racket over there. So, <clears throat> if you tell someone to direct the ball over there or touch the ball over there, they will not swing hard. But if you use the word hit, you're gonna spend the next 10 years trying to figure out how not to hit the ball hard. So what if I give him a definition? So when we're doing this one, we're gonna show him how to aim the ball cross court. So um, show me how hard you can hit the ball without hitting it out. So go to the, go to the baseline, show me your best shot you can hit without hitting the ball out. Okay. And you always let him throw up. Now, this, I gotta go to HR right after this because it's inappropriate, but how do you lose to a three foot midget that's 42 feet wide and doesn't move. How do you lose to that? In the play, there's only three ways you can lose a point. Number one, ball goes in that, right? Who has to pick it up? You do. Ball goes out, who picks it up? They do. I hit a winner. That's only three ways you can lose without cheating. So how do you eliminate that? First of all, any ball that goes in the net, the whole team has to run up and touch the net and go back in. Pretty soon, there are no more balls in the net because they take care of the problem his friends are going to fix it. I don't have to do anything. That's my job. I want to be the good guy. But if I tell him, I, don't hit the ball in the net. First of all, when you say don't do, like don't think of a pink elephant, you have to. Don't hit the ball in the net, man. You have to. So when you use the word don't, the brain has to see it. They've proven through science research, the brain does not recognize the word not. Well, don't use don't. Don't use don't. Exactly. When you say don't touch the candy, all the kid did was touch candy. Why did you do that? I just said don't do that. No, you didn't. You said to do it. I heard you. So when you say the word don't do something, it's going to happen. So ball goes in the net. You have to run back and touch the fence. I'm a genius. Oh, my God. <laughs> when you create a, a consequence for a shot, they'll fix it by themselves. And the ball in the net, how do you lose to a short person who's 32 feet, 36 feet wide and doesn't move? If once they happen to have to go pick up the ball, they'll stop. The worst thing you can do is give them, I like this. When I go to Europe, I get a basket of balls with 20 balls in there. At home, I have a basket with 300 balls. You miss, just feed another ball in, it's whatever. No, no, they get one ball to warm up with. If they miss it, go pick it up. And pretty soon, they mean, oh, I've got to keep the ball in play. I just can't hit another ball over. So think about what you're doing. Are you enabling people to make mistakes or are you helping them not make mistakes? So level three was as hard as he could hit without missing. Go again. Did he make it? Nope. Good. So he didn't hit level three yet. Level three is as hard as he can hit without missing. We'll take that. Now, level two would be so he and I could rally. So show me a ball where you, you and I can rally, okay? Back to me. Back to me. We're going to keep it in play, right? I'm going to rally. Okay, so that's a rally. Now, I want you to hit a ball that makes people cry and makes them go to the local coach and take lessons. Give me a level one speed. That grip's pretty old, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's so old it's falling apart in his hand. So don't hold your racket so tight. That's what? Oh, I'm sorry. On a scale of one to five, hold your grip pressure at two. Oh, that's different. I can measure that. Right, give me a high loopy ball that would make someone just want to go home and not play tennis. Oh, that's so ugly. When your kids can come in and say, I played so ugly, the player hated to play me today, they will win. Because no one is ever psyched. Here's a test. Your name again? Julian. What is it? Julian. Julian. Okay, Julian. Julian, no one has ever failed this test in my 50 years of coaching. Ready? Good job. That's a good question. <laughs> Which ball did you like best? No one has ever said I like the second ball best. In 50 years, so whew, thank goodness I was under pressure there. Good job, Julian. So when you play again, you want to start off the point with an ugly ball. Do one more time, Julian. Show me. Um, uh, here comes up my ugly ball. Hit it back for me, okay? We're, let's use the word hit again, right? He has a hard time hitting. He can't, ha he can't hit the ball harder than I can play it now because I neutralize him. He says, but he's learning how to push. No, he's learning how to set the point up. And as soon as, it, whenever you give a player a high ball, 
mathematics or geometry or physics, whatever it is, says a high ball comes in and it leaves your racket at that angle. So I use the high ball <coughs> to try to draw a short ball so I can hit a level two shot. <coughs> Excuse me. That was my bacon coming back up. <laughs> I was baking a mistake on that one. All right. <laughs> so if we were done today, because Michelle and I have to go to lunch after a while, so what, uh, what would be your takeaway if we were done today? What's one thing you could take away that you could do for your practice or for your players that you, you could use? Every shot yes. Change your be specific. Be specific. That's, now on the East Coast, there's Atlantic. On the West Coast, it's called Pacific. Do you want to be specific when you talk? Uh, that's another dad joke. Okay, I'm pretty bad about this. Okay. So the more specific you are with what you're saying, the players, if they're not getting something, it's because you didn't say it in a way they could understand it or measure it. Anything else? We were done today. Ugly balls are okay. Ugly balls are good. So whenever you come in and most of comes in and says, these people, they played so ugly, coach, I couldn't. All they do was hit looper balls. I said, yeah. When you can come back and tell me you, you played so ugly, then you're a good player. So the Brad Gilbert has a book out called Playing Ugly. What you do is you want to play ugly, pretty tennis, not pretty, ugly tennis. Because you want to play ugly first, and then you set up your pretty shots. If you hit pretty first, they play pretty against you. So pretty can't beat pretty. But ugly can make people go home and cry. Underspin beats top spin. <clears throat> so um, everybody says, when I hit the ball, coach, they keep lobbing over my head. So, Julian, would you get the ball back to me? Would you direct the ball back to me? See, it's hard when you've learned a certain word. <laughs> there's certain four-letter words you don't use. There's certain three-letter words you don't use. Hit is one of them. Can you aim the ball back to me? Can you direct the ball back to me? Monet's word hit, I got to figure out how to fix it because I just told them to smack the crap out of the ball. And I think they're stupid. And they think I'm stupid because I keep but you said hit it. I said, no. So can you direct the ball back to me, Julian? Good job. Now, I'm going to go back to me. I'm going to go back to you and you lob me, okay? So Julian goes back to me. Can you lob me? Crap, coach, that's why I never go to the net. I get lobbed every friggin' time. So Julian, go one more time. Ready? So Julian goes back to me. I didn't know what I'm saying. Julian, why didn't you lob me? Because short balls win points. Deep balls cause volleys and rallies. So the first thing we're looking for, if you watch the pros play, they, can, they never volley behind the service line. They never volley the ball deep unless the player's up, then they volley behind him. So the, the softer you can get them to volley, the more points they're going to win. And everybody tries to crush the volley. In fact, most volleys hit the building over there, roll back off the top of the roof, and then the balls collect outside the fence out there all the time. So Julian, come on up. Here's the best way to learn how, to, how not to hit the ball hard, but how to touch it and direct it and find the most critical part of the game, which is where you meet the ball. There's a lot of different ways to get to the ball. You've seen them all, but what happens right here, that's where everything happens, point of contact. So Julian, this one, sorry about the grip, man. <laughs> okay, this one you're gonna do a double touch. So on this one, uh, go back to the service line on the deuce court side, all right? The ball comes in, you're gonna touch it up in the air, and then touch it back to me. Touch, and come that ball right beside you, Julian. Got it. Touch, touch. It's called double touch. When I taught in China, <clears throat> the emperor in China was allowed to play double touch. No matter where the ball went, he could touch it, set it up, and then just put it away because I'm the emperor. So when you play again, you play double touch. And everybody says, yeah, but that's like a beginner game. I said, yeah, it's beginning a really advanced game we're going to use. But double touch is the best way to get your players to warm up because they learn not to hit the ball hard but how to control it and how to figure out where the point of contact is. If you notice, like, watch Julian go again. So Julian, double touch again. What did he have to do to get in position to make the shot? He had to move his feet. But if I said, Julian, move your feet, he goes like, I did. <laughs> okay, because I didn't ask for the right thing. It wasn't Pacific again when I went through. But if these, you try to find things that where the correction occurs and they discover it themselves and you point out how smart they were instead of telling them how smart you are by things like that again. So Julian, go again, double touch. All right, Julian, touch with your forehand and then return it with your backhand this time, ready? For the buck, yeah, he goes, touch. Good, all right, so touch with your forehand, 
then hit it back with your backhand. Oh my gosh, now he's warming up forehands and backhands and he's having to move his feet. So all your warm up drills you start off, don't let him do short court rally without doing double touch. Do one more time, Julian, ready? The ball comes in. He's a really good player, you could tell. Why, because he has top spin, right? I'm not that good, so I hit underspin. Because it makes it harder for you to hit the ball. And I can't even match his speed. So I go, okay, go again. I'm good. Underspin will beat topspin. So underspin is a shot you want to warm up with. If I had a beginner player, the first shot of teacher would be underspin. Because when they play, the opponent gives them high balls, you can chip it. Ball's low, you can chip it. Ball's too wide, I can chip it. Ball's too fast, I can chip it. Ball's too slow, I can chip it. When do I rip it? Every third Thursday when the ball's in this strike zone and the moon's in the seventh house and Jupiter aligns with Mars. But I said, but I see the guys on TV. I said, yes, they've been playing for 200 years. But if you watch them and they get in trouble, what do they do? Underspin. Because it buys them time, slows the pace down, and gets them going again. So if you have a group of players who are top spinners, they will get beat by the first underspinner they play. If you have a beginner, they can beat most everybody by playing underspin first. And then you add the top spin. So, Julian, um, show me how to hit an underspin shot when the ball bounces high. Show me how to hit a ball underspin when it gets too low. Show me how to ball when it's too fast. Once he develops those skills, now notice, you notice he doesn't turn. You don't have to turn. These, these shots, when you hit underspin, you don't turn. You don't go, because now you put the racket behind you. When they say turn, they talk about turning your shoulder not your feet. You don't get sideways to hit. When you feed a ball in, you're never sideways when you feed the ball in. Because first of all, your racket's already behind you. When you feed the ball in, you start facing the net. You put your right foot forward so you can walk through the ball. In golf, you can stop and hit. In tennis, you've got to move and hit. If you turn sideways, you can't move. He said, but all the coach, I said, I know. They start off facing the net. As they step in, they turn. I said, see, you turn. I said, not to start the point, though. Everything you do is start off open stance. And then from there, you push off, and it creates the appearance of being sideways to hit. But if you have players start off, get side to the net, drop the ball, and then follow through. I can't, because uh, my legs are locked. This, this leg's in the way. When you go, I, if you watch the Olympics, they have a guy who fences. He fences off his front foot. He can't fence off this foot. Okay. It looks pretty stupid, but that's why, that's why it looks stupid trying to hit a ball with your, on your front foot. The outside foot, if it's on the right side, your right foot leads. If it's on the, back, the left side, your left foot leads. So my backhand is my best side because having grown up playing basketball, you have to play defense by getting behind the ball first. If you turn your feet sideways, guy's going around you. Tennis is the same way. When you get turned sideways to hit, it's tough to move because you, you're too close to the ball, too far away. The idea when you play is you're, you're doing inchworm. You're inching behind the ball. Then you push off into the shot and everybody see you stepped into the ball really well. I've never purposely stepped into a ball. I've pushed off into the ball, a lot of balls. If you step, you're on the wrong foot. You feel about the front foot, your right foot's your power foot. When I drove here, well, I didn't drive here, I flew here, and Jamie picked me up and she drove here. But anyhow, my right foot is my accelerator, my left foot's the brake. So I want to accelerate on the shot, I'm on my right foot. That lets me accelerate into the shot. On my left foot, I break the shot. So you're always on your outside foot to push off into the shot. Okay, I need another hitter. I need another person who would like to direct the ball back to, to Julian. Come on out, guys. So I need one more player. Come on in. All right, I love it. Way to go. Come over on this side. You're going to rally with Julian. Your name? Tatiana. Tatiana? Yes. All right, I'm Ken. All right, so this one. The, do, we're going to do the uh, little short court double touch real quickly, real quick, the service line. Double touch, uh, forehand or backhand, doesn't matter. The point is you should not be feeding tennis balls. You should be coaching players. So you get them so they learn to hit with each other. So learn, first of all, they're learning how not to hit the ball hard. See, this is a great example of hitting level one speed. But I said, uh, but we play matches at a higher speed, right? All right, now move back to the baseline. So this is called double touch. From the baseline, it's called absorb the speed and rip the ball. So this time, okay, absorb the speed. Now hit it back pretty aggressively, level two. So she's learning how to absorb speed. And I'm not doing anything. I'm just, you know, having a sack and talking on my cell phone and getting fired from talking on my cell phone while I was coaching, right? <laughs> Got it. So you see what they're doing? Once again, now I'm free to move around. 
So what if I have a lot of players, though? Uh, I need two more players real quickly. Go. Don't be shy. I need another player. Uh, I need one more player. Great. Got a racket? You can play with uh, my Yannick's racket or the Arthur Ashe comp racket. Or you can play with that, that one right there. Take your pick. Grab your one there. Sure. All right. Go behind Julian. Go behind Tatiana. Most of us have a lot of players on one court. So the best way to get them to move their feet is to have them hit and rotate. All right, so Tatiana, you're going to set the ball up, and you've got to play it back. Yeah, you're going to set the ball up, Julian, and you're going to play it back like that. That's okay. It's okay. Don't lose that little three-foot guy at the net. If you need several touches, that's okay. I right, go again. What I'm doing is they're having to strategize. She's having to think, where do I hit the ball so he can get to the ball? So now instead of just hitting balls, you're involving tactics and strategy at the same time. All right, you ready? Here we go. So the drill is square two to square two, not cross court, because we're trying to get them to keep the ball deep, right? So they know right away, oh, it landed in square one. <coughs> so double touch, absorb and rip. At the same time, I've got four more players on the other side. So I've got eight players, in, I've got eight players involved, and I'm, I can free to coach. And they're not overhitting. Because if she doesn't absorb the ball right, and he doesn't hit it back, and what you do is you play the deuce court team versus the ad court team. Oh, now we're competing. I have to be cooperative instead of just smacking the ball hard. Does that make sense? The whole idea is how to make things simple enough that you don't have to do anything. But the players learn how to manage the, the, the direction, the speed, and the spin. Okay, everybody out here, hold your right hand up. Put your thumb up. The most important part of the game is, did the ball go over the net? Number two, point your finger. What direction did it go? Number three, what depth did it go? Depth is under direction. And how you manage depth is with the spin, under spin, top spin, or side spin, and speed, level one, level two, or level three. So there's three speeds you can do every drill at. There are three spins you can hit. That's six things on your lesson right now. There are three different depths you can hit, deep, short, and medium, and three different directions, cross court, down the line, and middle, and get the ball in play. So I have 13 options on every lesson I do. Everybody said, what's your lesson plan? I said, it's in my hand. Get the ball in play. We're good. Direction, can you go cross court? We're good. Now can you hit square two to square two? Oh, that's depth. Now can you control the spin of the ball? Can you do underspin, top spin, or side spin? Yes. Can you control the speed? Level one, level two, level three. So this one, ready? So I'm gonna change the purpose of the drill. This time you guys, you're gonna set it up. The hitter has, has to direct the ball back level three speed. The hardest speed you can hit without missing. If the ball goes in the net, you have to go up and touch the net and go back again. You guys are gonna hit level one. Set it up, make them cry, make them come take lessons from you because they can't play pushers. Ready, here we go, go. So once again, I'm, I'm in control of everything and I haven't told them anything. Ready, guys, go. Ready, so they're gonna go set it up. I mean, you guys are, yeah, you're gonna set up so he can hit again. Got it, set it up. Tatiana's gotta get it. Oh, that, that's a Polish shot. <laughs> hit the pole back there, sorry. My brain, my brain goes weird. It thinks of weird things like that. <coughs> ah, good hands. Make him cry. Make him cry, Tatiana. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Okay. Set it up and rip. Oh, I love it. Way to go. Learning how to play defense. They're moving their feet. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to say move your feet. When the pros play, they average 8 to 12 steps between shots. They hit a ball. And it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay. The lower your skill level, the fewer steps you take. So how do you go from being, a, say, a 4-0 player to a 3-5 player? Drop two steps in your movement. How do you go from 4-0 to 3-0? Drop four steps in your movement. Every two steps you take away from your movement will drop you one skill level. But every two more steps you take will raise you one more level. So what we do, we have a chart. It says uh, 10 to 12, professional. Okay, 8 to 10, college. Uh, 6 to 8, high school, and then all the way down like that again. We let them choose. They get to choose. Like uh, Tatiana says, okay, I'll take uh, two steps. I say, okay, great. 
You guys are going to play cross court. He chose eight steps. You take more than two steps, you lose the point. What? Yeah, you can't, you, that's what you said. You want to play two steps because everybody wants to take as little movement as possible. So once she takes two steps, she says, I can't do it in two steps. I said, I know. With 10 push ups, you can buy two more steps. Now you take four. She says, I still can't get it. You took four. You took more than four. You lose a point. So, how would you create a teaching situation? Yes? You said you competed with the, uh, the ad court versus the deuce. Yeah, deuce court team is trying to rally more balls than the ad court team does. The other group of four going right. Uh huh. Like that. Good question. So, the deuce court is playing the ad court. So, I talk pretty fast, but I can go to Southern because I lived in Tennessee and then Alabama. <laughs> And I, I played tournaments in Alabama, Mississippi, and, and I lived in Atlanta. And they would start a sentence, and I could finish it before they got there, but I knew what they were going to say. They just couldn't get it out fast enough. So I speak English in Southern, and sometimes I always kind of slip into Southern real quick like that. But if I talk too slow, just say, go south. Okay, and I'll slow it down a little bit. So what's your takeaway? Teamwork, working together. Yeah. It's not where they're competing against each other. As soon as I could put it, say, <coughs> if I had just Julian and uh, Tatiana out, and I said, okay, uh, rally cross court. And they said, like, till Tuesday? I said, no. Till you get, uh, give them a number. And, but what happens is you're competing against the ad court team. Oh, now I got to do teamwork. So how do you get them to not kill the ball? Give them a team project. Deuce court versus, and you can do the same like we just said with this drill. Deuce court versus ad court. So now they're playing as a team, but you're not the bad guy. You're not yelling, Tony, the ball's so hard. The partner will take care of that. You're never the bad guy in that situation. All right, so these are one of my easy ways to start off with. Um, up your alley. Everybody, uh, Julian, come on up again real quick. Tatiana, come on up real quickly again. Do we have any cones out here? How do you teach without targets? Uh, if there's not, we have four squares, but if you use cones, you never have to explain anything. Because you can number the cones, one, two, three, four, and you just say, go to square three. What it does, it makes it, if I, when I play, my target becomes a line because that's the only thing I see. My son, he played at Collins for two years. Now he's at Chapman University in L.A. He said, Dad, I keep missing like two or three inches all the time in these shots. I said, because you're aiming for the line. I said, go back to aim for the middle of the court. So if you watch the pros, if you put a, if you take your pencil and go to the TV screen and put, it, put your pencil or the eraser there, and there, 80% of the balls they hit are between this part of the court and that part of the court. 80%. Now, they're hitting the ball at 70, 80 miles an hour, but they, the ball is so hard, they can't afford to change direction. Now, once they get a shorter ball, the guys, then they'll do a COD. It doesn't mean collect off that. It means change of direction. So you're not allowed to do a COD unless you can move into the ball. So you keep going cross-court, cross-court, cross-court. Like you see the pros do on TV. You want to play like the pros? Don't change the direction of the damn ball. But everybody said, yeah, but I got to make him run. I said, no, you got you to make him give you a ball where you can make him run. You just don't change it because you want to. So do you guys start in the alley? So normally I would have a cone because when if I say, hit the ball back to, to Julian. You said hit it to Julian. I said, no, I, I'm sorry. I mean, hit the ball short enough so Julian could say that, could make the ball back. Oh, that's different. So if you give him a target, this is the cone. It was, I took these, I got these cones from India. And I, they got him, I bought him off this guy who sold shrunken heads, and he shrunk the ball, shrunk the cones down to little tiny balls like this again. So you could get him through customs without having to pay for him. So your goal is to do a double touch and try to hit the, hit the target. Would you guys do the same over there in the alley? So you're going to go feed the ball in, and you're trying to rally in the alley. It's called up your alley. You've got to be careful how you say that one too, because... <laughs> go ahead, ready? Here we go. So double touch in the rally. Keep it in play. Ready? Here's the ball for you. Got a ball over there? Got it. Go ahead. Double touch. So once again, always emphasizing footwork. When the feet don't work, the strokes can't work. So when you see something wrong up here, it's down there. And if you want to get better, take more steps. So the best, another way to get them to do it, like they, if they stop it backhand, they got to hit it back forehand. If they hit a forehand, they got to hit it back backhand. So once again, I'm, I'm able to coach now. I can actually coach. I can have another alley in the middle. I can have another alley set up back here. So I can have 10 or 12 players on one court, and they're all doing something that involves them seeing the ball. At this speed, they can feed the ball. All right, now, time out. Everybody stop just a second. You have to play, yeah, the game is called yes or no, and it's how I warm up. After you make the shot, Julian, go back to me again, okay? Yes, 
Meaning, yes, I saw the ball spin. No, I didn't see it spin. And somebody says, you ready to play? I said, no, I have too many no's on my side. I haven't seen the ball yet. If you don't see the ball in the warm-up, you're sure as hell not going to see it when you start to play. Because you can't. The ball's too fast. But you try to on every shot. In a real match, you might see the ball spin maybe 10% of the time. But you're trying to do that 100% of the time because it keeps your eye on the ball. So after you touch the ball back, say yes or no. Okay. Yes, I saw the ball spin. No, I didn't. No, spin on the ball. You see the ball actually turning. In or out? Yeah, in or out. Either way. Uh huh. Okay. That's like In-N-Out Burger. Okay. It works the same way here. It's In-N-Out. <laughs> okay, so what could you take away that you could use? Hopefully, I've helped you redesign your practice programs. To help These. Practice, watch the spin. Yeah. Now, the brain perceives watch and see as two different skills. I go home and I watch TV till I see a program I like. I'm watching the group, then I see you. The brain means see means to focus on. Watch means to look at. So he said, I thought I was watching the ball. I said, you were. And the fence and the net and the sky and the airplane went by too. So you need to say the word see because the brain sees, oh, you want me to focus on the ball, not just look at where it is. When you actually play at this level, you can actually see a yellow stick leave your racket. You can't see it coming in, but you can actually see a yellow stick leave your racket. It's like when you go skiing and you have to go to the bathroom in the snow, it makes a yellow stick. That's TMI, TMI, okay. <laughs> Okay, coach, all right, time out for the players. So everybody at the net, instead of saying, everybody come on in, everybody go to the net. To the net, to the net, to the net, net, net. That's what we tell over to the Lone Ranger, okay. That's before your time too. So what did you like about warming up like that? I liked watching the ball. Seeing the ball. Off the Seeing the ball. Yes. Right. Um, I like the pace of it. It's nice and controlled, nice and... Yeah, I got him to control the pace without me saying don't hit the ball so hard because when I say don't hit the ball hard, what they heard was hit the damn ball hard. And I said, why did you do that? He said, you said that, coach. I said, no, I didn't. Reps. Reps. How do you get repetitions? I like focus. Focus level. All right. So here's a good way. How do you measure focus? Uh, put your rackets down, guys. Tatiana, come over on this side. Julian, on this side. Take a ball in your hand. Come over on this side real quickly. You guys get on the same side in the alley. Say, so you're on the alley, on the double sideline and single sideline. You're going to face each other. You're going to toss the ball back and forth. And every time you catch the ball, it changes directions. So you're going to use the alley. You're going to toss the ball back and forth to each other. Two balls in play at the same time. Ready, go. <laughs> Got it. Every time you catch the ball, do not have it go all the way across the court shuffling. It's like a typewriter. That, you know what a typewriter is. But a typewriter is one of those things that the carriage would keep going. Go. Catch the ball, change directions. You never go the same way. Every time you catch the ball, you change directions. Totally. Then you go the other way. Now go the other way. Now go the other way. That's how you play tennis. Now what they're actually doing, there's only three skills in a ball sport. You either catch it, that's a friggin' volley. You toss it, that's a ground stroke. You throw it, that's a serve. And that's all it really is. You put the stupid stick in your head. As soon as I put, my brain goes like, no. As soon as I put the thing in my hand. But pretty much you volley by catching the ball. You do a ground stroke, and that's a toss. And the serve's a throw. That's the only three skills there are. So make it as simple as you can. All right, now, this time, guys, you got to bounce the ball to each other. I got it. Ready? I got it. So this time, they have to bounce the ball to each other. And go. Bounce the ball to each other. you got to use two balls at the same time. Oh, wow. <laughs> we actually use four in a few minutes. We actually have two balls each, and they can do it. It's just the thought of the four freaks out their mind for a moment. All right, time out. The double sideline is going to toss the ball. The single sideline is going to bounce the ball. So you've got to be on the line. You've got to be on the line. Like that, on the line. All right, ready? So the double sideline is going to be the tosser. The single sideline, excuse me, single sideline is the bouncer. Ready, go. I want to see how fast they can change tactics in a match. So if I'm losing, I'm going to change my tactics really quickly. So how fast do they adjust? Okay, ready? Stop. If you're the bouncer, now you're the tosser. If you're the tosser, now you're the bouncer. What, what, what? Hey, ready, go. Here's what we do. They did ground strokes, volleys, and movement. 70% of your movement in a match is lateral movement. I've never, ever told a player to bend their knees, give me $20, please. Like the book says, something like that again. You tell them to widen their stance. You don't tell them to bend their knees. Of course, I can't bend this knee because it's got to be replaced. It's, it's going to be bent. It'll be straight someday. Too many years of tennis. <laughs> All right, everybody stop. Everybody come into the deuce court service box. 
Oh, you mean we know where the courts are? Like that, okay. Now, on a scale of one to 10, what was your focus level like? Oh, if, like 30. <laughs> no, okay, let's say it's courts. So 10's the highest and one's the lowest. 10? Seven or eight? About seven. I would say two. Okay. If there's if their focus level, how many of you heard the word focus? You gotta focus. How do you measure focus? We just did on a scale of one to ten. So they're, if they're eight, nine, or ten, they're competitive. Seven, six, and five, they're social. And below that, they're gonna hurt you or somebody else. So when they play again, I don't see many stroke errors, I see focus errors. So when they miss, don't say you didn't follow through, you gotta do this, whatever. Say one to ten, where was your focus? I was a five. That's measurable, but, but don't give them terms like focus, move your feet, aim higher, without giving them some way they can measure. So the first drill we do, especially when they've been sitting in school day and they're coming out to practice, the juggle drill. So I'm going to speak in Minnesota later on. I had a 176 high school coaches on one court, 176 coaches, and we're all doing the juggle drill. As soon as we start, everybody's laughing. They're focused, and then we call them in. 176 coaches, not one coach had a focus level less than seven. So I, they said, now, that's how you want to play. So the juggle drill, it looks like all this stuff's very cheap. It doesn't involve anything except two tennis balls. And you can do it off the parking lot before your king that's on the court, before you have to go play. But it's a way to get the players to get warmed up and focused before they start. Then go to double touch. All right, real quick, and uh, grab your racket real quick. Double touch volley back to each other this time. Now, there's a bunch of different drills here. I've never gotten through them ever yet, okay? Because this is, this is stuff that you use, whatever drills you already have, modify, do double touch volley. Because if you take whatever you already do, and you're always pretty successful, that's why you guys are here, or you're on the way to getting successful, and learning how, to, how do I do things that are really simple using the things I already use so my students already know, but we're getting a way we can measure it. Okay, yes or no? Yes, you saw the ball spin. No, you didn't. Yes, yes or no? Yes. So I can coach. I can go by and see who's saying yes, who's saying no. Are they saying yes before they hit the ball? Or are they saying yes, meaning, oh, yeah, I did see the ball? Yes. All right, time. Sorry. Really good. That's okay. Okay, wait, there is no sorry in tennis. Okay. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is have a double partner who says, I'm sorry. I said, I know you are, but don't make people sorry for you. Because every time you say sorry, I say, no, no, that's okay. You're freaking distracting me. I know you didn't mean to make a mistake. To say, next point, let's go. Uh, Julian, come back and block me. I'm going to keep the ball in play. This game is called Fast Gun. I grew up, I want to be a, I want to be a cowboy. I was born in Indiana, so it didn't work. But I want to be Roy Rogers. That's an old time guy. Old Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Lone Ranger, all those guys. And I, have, I still have my gun and holster set, my shooting, my Mattel shooting shell gun and holster from when I was a kid. I wear it at Halloween. I get to be a kid every Halloween. Then I want to be Superman too because you can fly. But what I really liked was being a magician. I was pretty cool when they do tricks. And now I'm willing to play for the Globetrotters because I was a basketball player. So we're going to involve all those guys in my next drill. So Julian, if you'll volley back to me, let me put this thing so I don't kill myself. I used to play music. I was an accordion. I'm trying to get this chord to go in there. And according to what I know, it doesn't want to go there. All right, so I'm going to rally back to me. Ready? Here's the last gun. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. So I've got my fast gun. What it does, it makes me take my hand forward to volley. Most of the ball comes, they pull their hand backwards. Fast gun, when they touch the rip twice, grab the racket and volley. So ready to go again. So it goes, one, two, go. One, two, go. All right, now I want to be Superman, because Superman has to fly. So I put the racket in my left hand. Okay, back to me again. I go, Superman, Superman, Superman. Now I want to be the magician, so I take the racket behind my back, so I'll hide it so he can't see it. Good job, Go again, one more time, ready? Glove trotters between the legs, back out, between the legs, back out. That's my fault. No, that's right, don't apologize. That's how you teach the players to volley. You have a ton of time when you play. 
Same thing works on the ground stroke. So now you're gonna, real quick, you guys get to try it over there. Real quick, you're ready to go. Double, do a fast gun or Superman? Fast gun. And the magician. Okay, ready to go. They learn how to keep the ball in play. They learn the, the net. Don't freak out. You have more time than you think you do. So all these are designed so it's called self-discovery or guided discovery. I'm guiding them so they can discover the things I want them to learn. And I show how smart they are. Look, they're amazing. Look how fast your hands are. You always try to point out to people why they're good or why they're successful. All right, this time, Joey, move back to the baseline. Back to the baseline. You two stay up. Same thing. Sign they got to hit a ground stroke and then do fast gun between the legs like that again and they're volleying up here. Ready to go. You got to do something back there. Fast gun. You guys got to do ground stroke back there, right, Julian? Superman, fast gun. Magician. So sometimes players hit the ball so hard, but this shows them that they have more time than they think. So all you're trying to do is show them on the the space continuum, how much time they actually have to hit. But you can't tell them that. They don't believe you. This lets them see it. So they do ground strokes like we did earlier a while ago. But they, they do double touch, set it up behind the back, then hit the ball back. Uh, fast gun, hit it back, have your partner go. So good lob. And drop shot. That's a lob drop shot. Okay, she's pretty good volley, but her volley sucks because she's on the wrong foot. She volleys like with her left foot in front. So where's her racket? Back here. If she goes to the right foot in front, the racket goes out here. When you go to your, anytime the ball's on your right side, your right foot should go forward first. Okay, uh, everybody come in real quickly again. Uh, stand up for me. Name? Come on out, Megan. Megan was genetically born to be a good player. It came out, you know, from mom that way. Catch the ball with your right hand. Good, catch the ball with your left hand. Which foot did she move first? Which one of the ball's on? You're genetically born when the ball's on your right to go with your right foot. You're not genetically born to do this to volley. Because you can't move, your feet are blocked. There's no way you can move into the shot. So go again, ball goes over here. Good, now while the ball goes forward, you to do it again without bending over. Bring your right foot forward. Bring your right foot forward. Go again. What happens if your left foot goes in front your hand goes backwards. If your right foot goes forward, the hand goes out. So if I have something on my shelf, I collect antiques. If it starts to fall, I'm gonna go, oh, I gotta get that one. Oh, damn, it didn't make it. If your right foot goes forward, you go out under. So the first shot you teach a beginner is put the right foot in front, put the racket out here, here comes the ball. Bump it over the net. Because they can see it and the racket's already set to go up. You put the left foot in front, the racket, they swing or can't, or they play half volleys versus volleys. So the first thing you have them do is learn how to use their outside foot. Ball goes to the left. She's genetically born to do that. So I put a stupid stick in her hand. Now, now I can volley. No, you can't. Well, then the coach told me to step into the ball with the other foot, not that foot. You step with this foot first. Playing baseball, I played third base. My dad said, look, you get a ground ball, Ken. You got to bring this foot in front so you can make the throw. You put the left foot in front, you got to do a skip step. Guy's already there. So if you learn how to use your footwork the way an athlete would move and not like a tennis player, you've already increased their athletic skills. If you teach them how to catch a ball, toss the ball, throw the ball, without using the word hit, they become athletic. Your eye tells the player what to do. It tells them when to swing, how much to move their feet. And whenever you see an error, and we're gonna work on that on Sunday about when you see an error, it's not the error. I went to the doctor and he says, you have a sore throat. I said, I knew that when I came in, what's causing my sore throat? The good doctor can tell you what's causing it. Okay. Dylan says, I'm not sure, but take this stuff. It worked for somebody else when you go through. So All right. Yes? On a backhand volley, do you still want them to step with their right foot? No. Left, left foot. Left. Once you go with your right foot, where's your racket go? It's like the meow, meow, cat commercial. Meow, 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 <laughs> meow, 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 meow. When if it's on your left side, you want your hand to go forward. My backhand, your backhand volley should be the easiest volley in the game. Everybody's good on the backhand volley because this foot goes forward first to move in. If I go with this foot, I can't move. My foot is now sideways. I can do a face plant or I can stop. But we were always told, I know you were told, they've lied to you about other things too. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> they just did it because that's what they were taught. 
my, my family's, my wife's family's from Norway, and there's no way you're gonna get this joke, but I'll do it anyhow. They used to always cut the ends off the roast. So we'd have a dinner and I'd cut the ends off. That's the best part for me. But so I said, why do you guys do that? So I don't know, Grandma did it. I said, Grandma, why did you cut the ends off the roast? Because we had a small pan. Okay. <laughs> so don't do stuff that you were told without understanding why you did it. Just dumb stuff that you do, just pass on. Well, that's what the way my coach taught me. I said, yeah. But if you watch the pros actually play, they play very athletically. But they will teach you. I'm a pro volley player. I'm a professional player. They will teach you things that somebody taught them, but when they play, they don't do that. So watch an athlete move. Yes. Okay, and you're saying you step with your right foot, but then it, because you're going to bring the next foot forward. Right. So I can move through the ball. You're supposed to move through a volley. Well, There's, head's really spinning right now. I know, exactly. <laughs> Everybody does, and it's like really weird. But uh, Julian, do you feed me a ball again real quickly? So I'm up here at the net. The ball comes in, and I'm going to... Damn. Well, oh, help. You need a continental grip, though. Yeah, because I'm hitting the ball back here. I need a continental grip. Why would you buy the continental grip with the racket out in front? The pros said, but I don't have time to change my grip. I said, you can change grips on the baseline, but you can't change it with the net. I said, it's the same distance. So when you did this, what kind of grip did you have? Uh, I don't know. You're right. It doesn't matter. It's just how do you make the strings point there? But I've never used one grip to volley with. The only thing I use, and I try to avoid using the word continental grip, because that's two things they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear split step. They don't want to hear continental grip, because they know they can't do it. It's a number two grip. Okay. One's on top, eastern backhand. Two's a serve, three's a forehand. Four's your semi-western forehand. So you just use the number you're going to use. So put the numbers again. All right. All right, volley back to me again. So ball comes in, and I'm saying, here comes the ball. If you notice why I was volleying when I go, I did not turn my feet. Because once I do this, I can't move for the shot. That's called a butt shot. Sorry about that, guys. Didn't mean to do that. When you play. So your takeaway is keep things as simple as you can possibly keep them. And um, I'm open to text, emails. Now, what was it you said? My brain is spinning. I'm going to try to explain some of the things that go through like that. But these are all natural skills. If you have the players come out and play, Julian, come over real quick again. Uh, no racket. Just put your racket down quick. And we're going to play tennis over the net with our hands. Guess what? If I, if I, don't, if I look up like... Damn, I said, okay, work on your eye-hand coordination today because your eye needs to tell your hand where to go. Do you grab your racket again? Hold it by the throat. We're going to play tennis off the grip. Up, I looked up. Oh, no. No, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. You didn't hit the ball. If my eye is really still, I can rally. My son can rally like 30 ball rallies off the grip. I could swear I'm looking at the ball. I said, well, uh, I don't think so. Your eye looked away too quick because my mind pictured the shot. Okay, let's do it off the edge of the racket. Ready? You can, you can do it like this, John. Let's go straight ahead. One, two. Make them do weird stuff. Because then they figure it out and it's fun. Pretty soon, you see them out there practicing warm-up, doing stuff by themselves. Shows they have good eye-hand coordination. Big hand for my players. You guys did a great job. Go we'll bring the balls in real quickly. Um, there's got to be a few questions. Some of you guys, are, whatever dumb question you're trying to ink, think about, somebody else think about it too. So don't be the one who's shy because they're thinking it, they don't have the courage to ask it. All right, so my thing is, I've always been told to do that. Square up, turn your body sideways, and hit your shot. So you're saying always what, keep your body forward? Forward, so you can move into the ball. When you need a ground stroke, you turn. What part of the body do you turn? The top part, not the bottom part. Because now you're set up because you created a torque. There's no torque when you're sideways. There's no torque. You're here, you watch the pros, they all set up here because they create torque. They, then they push off into the shot. If the ball's too close, they push out away from the ball. If the ball's too deep, they push back. So there's three types of footwork. You, you push into the shot. I've never told a word of player to have step into the ball. You push. When I walk, I don't step. I push, then I create the step. I push. I walk by pushing. I don't walk by stepping. Stepping will happen after I push. But if you turn sideways to hit, you put the racket behind you. Yes? Yes. How do you teach underspin? Underspin? Good question. That's the first thing you teach, and you start off by doing do this. Can you make the ball spin? Like that. Then you just have them spin it over the net, and then somebody spins it back like that again. Choke up on the racket if they need to. Underspin will destroy topspin every time. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, so can you show me backhand ground 
construct. Uh huh. And you're one because I'm been, I'm old school. Step in, you know. Yeah. So show me on the backhand how to use it. Because if you don't, they're going to set their feet in golf. You can do that in golf. Loading on the left. Foot, Load on the left. Turn it, and then, and then as you're hitting, you're going to hold. Right. You're always trying to move into every shot you can. You set up, if it's on the left side, it create, when you go with the left foot, it creates a torque. My best shot is about 200 because it's a low ball to my backhand. That's my best shot in the game. You give me a low ball to my backhand, you're going to eat the ball. Because I put this foot in front so I can play the shot. This foot in front, I can't play the ball. Uh, yeah. Don't fix the technique. Fix the foot work, and it'll make the hands work. Yes? You said three spins, three levels, and three depths or something like that? Yeah. The, the, your tactical priorities. You have three types of spins. You have top spin, underspin, and side spin. Okay. You have three different depths, short, medium, and deep. You have three different directions, down the line, cross court, and down the middle. There's 13 options on every lesson that you do. And you want to know who would use this shot, what is this shot, when does it happen, where does it happen, and why do I use it? So on one hand, I have my five W's. I'm a journalist. I write who, what, where, when, and why. If I left one piece out, like when to use this shot, uh, work on drop shots, say, oh, not when you're back there. Where do I hit it? Square one. Not, not short, because we're short. And then over here I have get the ball in play with direction, depth, spin, and speed. Three directions, three depths, three spins, and three speeds. And you always start off letting them hit the ball as hard as they can so they can get it in. Then you go to rally speed. Then you go to the speed that makes everybody cry and take tennis lessons. Yes? What about your serve as far as your torque and stuff? You're talking about when I, when I serve, you start off sideways. When they say toss the ball in front, this is not in front, it's beside you. <laughs> the pros toss, they turn, they toss the ball parallel to the baseline. Because when you're serving, you're, you're facing that way, so that's in front of you. If I throw the ball further in front, I said, no, that's beside you. You don't want to ever be beside yourself. That's like the worst place to be. Okay. And, how, and then when you go for ground strokes, you always have to have both hands on the racket. You reach out to figure out how much space you need. Then the left hand tells the right hand where to go. You want to hit top spin, hand goes up. Hit the ball flat, hand stays up. Hit the ball in the net, hand goes down. Do not fix a forehand right hand. Fix the left hand if they're right-handed. The other hand controls this hand. So the guy thinks he's in charge. His wife is. He says, honey, <laughs> take your racket back here. Honey, you need to be this far away from the ball. Honey, bring your hand up here so you need some place to go. So when you finish your shot, there's a starting point, ending point. You see all kind of weird stuff like that? It's this hand doesn't work. Because this hand controls that hand. Everybody spends all their weeks working on this hand. If you don't fix this hand, this hand will never go to work. If you would like, I've got some stuff off, off side here because we got another speaker coming up. I have the, the rackets at $50 a piece, whatever you'd like to choose. It's part of my collection. My wife said I need to reduce it because I have 2,000 rackets at home and about 1,800 books. I sold four books online yesterday to a pro down in Florida. He bought 40 books, and I put them in a box. It only cost me $38 because it's media mail. Would have cost him $250 regular mail. And I've got um, the Monsters in the Mind book and the Strategy book that tells you how to play against, if you want to coach anybody, here's how to play a single player, double player, six things to do, three things not to do, and I got to get out of here. Thank you, guys. <laughs>